In history's pages, where tales of valor and endurance abound, few stories shine as brightly as the Battle of Mons, an unwavering testament etched into the British Expeditionary Force's very core. Swift as lightning, these dauntless soldiers, arriving by rail from their homeland just days prior, faced an unimaginable introduction to the war. It came in the form of a formidable challenge, a German force four times their number, composed of the enemy's finest. For four relentless days, they were engulfed in a maelstrom of combat, emerging unwavering and undaunted. What might have spelled the annihilation of British power became instead a strategic evasion from the enemy's grasp, clearing the path for the resilient resurgence that would repel the surging German tide. Amidst the fiery crucible of Mons, unfolding between August 23rd and August 24th, 1914, the 1st Battalion Gordon Highlanders bore the brunt of the tempest, losing officers, non-commissioned soldiers, and comrades to battle's voracious moor, consigned to the lists of the slain, the wounded, and the vanished. Among the survivors, Private J. Parkinson stands resolute, a witness and chronicler of those grim days. His words a lingering echo of the courage that defied all odds within the crucible of combat. Join us now as he describes in his own words the valour, triumph and heartbreak of those fateful days. This is World War I, the Battle of Mons, a symphony of destruction, and you are listening to The Law Network. Sunday, August 23rd, a date forever etched in memory as the gateway to an epic reckoning. We had had arrived in Belgium and gathered our expeditionary force in an area close to Mons. We spent the morning digging trenches in the blistering August sun. Midday arrived laden with the gravity of imminent fate, and I, a seasoned scout, accompanied by a stalwart corporal and a trio of unwavering comrades, embarked on a fateful mission of reconnaissance. The sun hung high overhead, casting its unyielding gaze upon our expedition as we ventured forth, ignorant of the crucible of challenges awaiting our footfalls. I must acknowledge the furnace of this land's summer. Our khaki uniforms bore witness to this fervent embrace of the sun's fiery caress, the energy-sapping heat compounded by the weight of our burdensome kits. A towering tree loomed near our station, its gnarled branches extending skyward. Daring acrobatics ensued as I, the eager scout, scaled its form, my limbs embracing the bark as the world unfurled below my perch. As I reached the top, my world seemed very different. Below me lay the forest, a sleeping green giant far removed from the distant artillery that carried on the wind. Then, without warning, some unknown insect zipped past my head, making me flinch slightly. I was about to look around in search of the bug when another and another zipped past my head. Then, with a sobering crack, one struck the bark of my tree and exploded into a million splinters. It suddenly and savagely dawned on me that these were no insects. These were the sinister whispers of bullets, borne by the wind and punctuated by the ominous hiss of the projectiles, shattering the tranquillity. The foe had laid bare its lethal game, casting their malevolent dice upon our existence. Bullets hissed and snapped past my head, some colliding with branches, sending a cloud of dust into the air from the old tree. By some mercy of fate I descended unharmed, falling the last ten feet rather than descending with care. We sounded the clarion call, urging anyone in earshot to flee the impending tempest. Hell had arrived in my world as reality was torn to shreds by lead and fire. The call to arms resounded like the heavens tearing apart, a cascade of thunderbolts hurling forth a deluge of destruction directly into our midst. Each bullet sang its own deadly melody, a declaration of belligerent intent. We five souls amidst the frenzy of aggression found ourselves thrust against an onslaught of metal and wrath that aimed to engulf us bullets and explosions tearing apart reality itself, with us right in the center of it all. We did not simply run, we flew, like wraiths tearing across the open ground back towards our comrades, a ballet of frenzied limbs and racing hearts propelling us toward the trench, that sanctuary carved into the earth's bosom. It's strange how one reacts to the threat of imminent death sometimes. Delirious laughter intertwined with the urgent rhythm of pounding steps, an uncanny rhythm as five souls swept up in a frantic sprint, like that of mischievous schoolboys fleeing an orchard, their laughter reverberating as they evade the wrath of an angry farmer and the bite of his vigilant guard dog. 
Such is the essence of our Highland brethren. Steeped in the very core of resilience and audacity, these men stride through the crucible of adversity without flinching, their valour, a steady flame that not only withstands the howling gales of fear, but engulfs them in its fervent embrace. It's a flame that burns brighter as the storm rages, an unconquerable spirit that moulds them into unyielding warriors, even in the face of an onslaught that could obliterate mountains. I descended to the trench floor with all the grace of a gravity-bound nosedive, crashing face first into the gritty soil. A cascade of stumbling bodies followed suit, my comrades tumbling atop me in a chaotic jumble of limbs and equipment. By some miracle, we had managed to find our way back to the sheltering arms of our own front lines. Those very lines were now grasping the gravity of the situation. Here and there, men seemed to awaken from their false sense of security, now humming with an urgency. A canvas onto which the strokes of preparation were hastily being painted into a scene of impending defiance. The Goliath of opposition loomed, its weight pressing down upon us, Yet we, the stalwart few, the David, stood poised to offer our unwavering resistance. Whispers from the front lines unveiled a staggering advancing tide of 15,000 Germans, an amalgamation of the Kaiser's most formidable battalions. Among them, the venerable Imperial Guard, renowned artisans of military brilliance, now ready to unleash their mastery upon us in the theatre of war. We, the 8th Brigade, stood as the barrier against this swelling deluge, a mere handful of resolute souls in comparison. The Royal Scots, the Royal Irish, the valiant diehards of the Middlesex, and my own brethren of the Gordon Highlanders, proudly bearing the colours of B Company. In the forge of chaos, where survival was etched into the very fabric of necessity, the choreography of strategic withdrawal unfolded. A retreat not born of cowardice, but rather marked by tactical wisdom. We did not falter, nor would we capitulate into complete withdrawal, but we needed to regroup and launch a counter-offensive. To our right, the Royal Scots stood sentry, while the Royal Irish and the unyielding Middlesex took their positions on our left flank. The British Royal Field Artillery, those architects of destruction whose thundering crescendos have echoed through the annals of history, joined our ranks, inscribing their legacy with each fiery proclamation that erupted from their cannons. The Battle of Mons had begun, a canvas of destiny on which British gunners would craft their magnum opus of valour. Then, like a tidal wave of assault, the first onslaught crashed upon us. A seismic tremor ripping through the ranks, our brief respite amidst the chaos shattered beneath the deafening roar of machine guns as the Germans unveiled their deadly plan. The Royal Irish, caught unguarded, bore the brunt of this merciless opening, the grim harbingers of death finding their mark with chilling precision. Mons, a town of industry, rested in the shadow of coal mines, a backdrop of labour and toil against which our saga unfolded. Our refuge lay in a neighbouring village, a peaceful hamlet divided by the stark incision of the road to Paris. The trenches became our fortress, granting us a perch over the expanse that stretched ahead, a mosaic of villages, coal mines and fields extending to the horizon. Nature's impediments had been subdued, foliage and hedgerows cleaved aside, bestowing upon us a panorama that extended beyond a mile. Our rifles gaze unobstructed, ready to dispatch their messages across this stage of fate. On one hand, the guardian arms of forests stood vigilant, shielding our flanks. Amid this embrace, our revered gunners lay poised, prepared to unleash their choreographed chaos upon the Germans. This landscape held the murmurs of the clash yet to unfold, a prelude to the devastation that would paint the field in shades of death and valour. The valiant diehards, those unyielding souls of the Middlesex, steadfast comrades in arms, became unwitting martyrs in this grim performance, torn apart by the unrelenting embrace of shrapnel. The symphony of destruction played its mournful notes upon their ranks, and the aftermath, etched into the sombre ledger of casualties, unveiled the extent of their sacrifice. Souls vanquished, wounded, or swallowed by war's insatiable appetite. The Gordons, my brethren in arms, readied ourselves to play our part on the stage of war. The Germans took aim, their weaponry unleashing its fury, 
Yet providence or distance, perhaps both, granted us a reprieve from the full brunt of their malice. The beast, once more unbridled, bore down upon us with the fires of hell itself. Death itself roared from enemy lines, the sky ignited by a deluge of fire and fury. Yet, emerging from the crucible, our ranks endured, battered but unbroken, defiant candle flames flickering in the winds of annihilation. Then came the glorious reply. Our own cannons, those roaring heralds of doom, echoed in a harmonious pledge of retribution, a proclamation that the German reign of terror would face a reckoning. Each rhythmic salvo shaking the earth and reverberating through our very bodies. The cheers and shouts of our men muted by the deafening sound of cannon fire. The Germans, with unyielding ambition, strode boldly toward the gates of Paris, heedless of the opposition that dared to confront them. Yet, as the fray swelled into an inferno of courage and bloodshed, it became unmistakable that the British lion, though outnumbered and besieged, would not submit. The easy victory envisioned by the Germans materialized as a grueling fight for survival to be recounted through generations. Amid the gallery of thunder and fire, our field gunners trumpeted our defiance, their mastery over the destructive arts interwoven into the fabric of war. The Germans wielded the lethal instruments of war with great precision, each explosive proclamation a sombre sonnet to obliteration. The earth around me was scarred in black craters, drenched in the blood and limbs of those I called brother. Yet the expertise of the Germans did not extend to the artistry of the rifle, a reality that, in an alternate world, could have scripted the tale of Mons in bloodier ink. The rifle, that intimate extension of a soldier's essence, seemed to elude their grasp. In contrast, we, the unwavering Gordons, have evolved into a surgical force of exquisite marksmanship, orchestrating the dance of death with the barrels of our closest companions, our trusted rifles. I stood, my every movement a fluid motion, and unleashed hell from the barrel of my weapon. Beside me, my comrades moved as one, a symphony of synchronized action. Men rose to their feet, each execution a well-rehearsed step in this deadly dance, orchestrated with lethal finesse. Their fervent cries of encouragement faded into the cacophony of war's orchestra, gunfire and explosions merging into an otherworldly melody. Sweat, blood and earth mingled upon their resolute faces while each bullet met its destined target. Such unwavering valour and unmatched skill painted a portrait of unyielding courage. From the gaping mouths of their trenches, the Germans surged forth. A relentless tide of humanity congealed into menacing phalanxes, their sheer numbers intended to serve as a battering ram against our determination and superior marksmanship. Our rifles voiced their rebuttal, their staccato rhythm slicing through the atmosphere, reaping down the advancing masses like a farmer's scythe through ripened grain. Yet even amidst the fall of their comrades, the Germans pressed on, a ceaseless swarm of grey forms converging upon our positions. My attention seamlessly transitioned from one quarry to the next, my body moving with an almost instinctive precision. Each step deliberate, each shot accurate, a synergy of deadly purpose. Cock, aim, terminate the advance. Cock, aim, terminate the advance. The trusty Lee Enfield rifles, their lethal prowess amplified by skilled hands, conducted their grim task to perfection. Their effective killing range of 550 metres and capacity for firing 15 rounds per minute imbued them with unparalleled efficiency. The rhythm of our response was so relentless, so unceasing, that it seemed the barrels themselves might succumb to the scorching pace. Thought was a luxury we couldn't afford. Instinctive action was our only option. A morbid spectacle it became, a tipping scales of survival and demise, the fallen shielding the living, the very essence of humanity woven into a grim scene of devastation. Cannon fodder a term belying the cold arithmetic of a foe devoid of empathy, a descriptor for those hurled heedlessly into the inferno of conflict. The stark contrast of leadership was unveiled upon this brutal stage. British officers, the standard bearers of valour, strode forth, guiding their charges with resolute purpose, their bravery a beacon leading others to follow suit. In stark comparison, the German officers seemed to lag behind, a ghastly rearguard directing their troops not through inspiration, but with the menace of bayonets and bullets. 
the sight of the enemy's legions resolutely marching into the abyss bore witness to their resolve. Our arms held steadfast, our fire unwavering, and yet they advanced, a sea of grey silhouettes undulating amidst the storm of hellfire and lead. But our determination held firm, our line unyielding, for they dared not breach the threshold of our bayonets, the lion a formidable sentinel that stood unbroken. A mere stone's throw spanned the distance between us and the enemy, a mere three hundred yards that bore witness to the onslaught of human valour and suffering. Outnumbered fourfold, we locked eyes with the elite of Germany's ranks, those whose prowess on the field had been the subject of whispered legends. The oft-debated Uhlans, the equestrian incarnation of terror, charged into the fray on horseback, intent on testing their mettle against our unyielding spirit. Yet their charge met the symphony of our machine guns, a devastating eruption of death and fire akin to the unforgiving breath of some ferocious dragon quickly compelled them to reconsider their audacious gamble. Our rifles added their harmonious response and those horsemen, compelled into a hasty retreat, scattered like sparks caught in the wind, their horses fleeing in disarray, an aftermath of chaotic broken leaves in the swirling breeze. The initial tremor of fear that coursed through my veins yielded to an unshakable resolve that permeated our ranks. A camaraderie forged in the crucible of Highland unity fortified us, an unspoken pact between officers and men, a bond that bolstered our stance against the raging storm. Our esteemed colonel, a true Gordon in both name and nature, embodied the valour of legends, a bearer of the Victoria Cross earned in the crucible of the South African War. His very presence stood as a testament to the metal that pulsed within the heart of the Gordons, and his experience outshone the combined battlefield wisdom of those who dared to oppose us. I was tossed to the ground by the force of a shell exploding near my position, and as I regained my footing, I saw, amidst the chaos of mud, fire and blood, the gallant form of Major Simpson and a brave private by his side. Together, they moved like jaguars from cover to cover, dealing death as they did so. A steadfast recipient of the Distinguished Service Order, he was an inspiration to us all and epitomized the unyielding spirit that coursed through our veins. A hailstorm of lead and shrapnel sought to thwart their mission, yet they dared to venture into that ceaseless maelstrom, impelled by duty and honor. What was even more surprising is that they were smiling and cheering as they rained down destruction on German after German, daring them to face the reckoning of war. I cannot find the words to adequately convey to you how their heroism burned within our spirits and rallied us to fight. The air hummed with the malevolent multitude of projectiles bearing down upon us. Then, a deafening cacophony of destruction obliterated the earth around us. A shell, bearing the force of a celestial hammer, carved its path beside the Major and his companion, sending them into the air. A moor of ruin appeared beside them, seemingly poised to swallow them whole. Both men lay on the ground with serious injuries, and would surely bleed out or be picked off by the enemy within seconds. Oh, the horror of it! watching our brave men laying there beyond our reach with bullets of enemy gunmen kicking up mud beside them as they tried to end their lives. Yet fate smiled upon them that day. Suddenly, like Valkyries from the heavens, horses came soaring over our trench towards the two men in an ultimate act of valour. Comrades rallied, their arms raising the wounded onto the back of the noble steed, an improvised stretcher for the gallant Major and his courageous private. Even amidst the throes of bloody agony, the Major released a daring laugh, a testament to his unwavering spirit, a battle cry against despair. Fight men, fight with everything you have. He beckoned his comrades to continue the fight, a roar that pierced the chaos of war, a defiant shout that stirred our embattled hearts. And still, the valiant deeds unfurled, a pure manifestation of courage amidst the deafening horrors of war. Our section sergeant, Spence, emerged from the trenches, a fleeting silhouette against the backdrop of devastation. His rifle's retort sliced through the air, a precise note of defiance sung to the heavens, cutting down adversary after doomed adversary. Time seemed to freeze as I watched the cartridges twirl from his rifle in slow motion, his face etched with vengeful intent. Boom, 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 the Lee Enfield drummed as muzzle flares lit up his determined visage. 
Then disaster as his head snapped backward, struck by the bullet of a relentless foe. A fleeting silence was punctuated by his descent. A prelude to a mournful howl as we saw him cut down to his knees. Yet miraculously he remained upright there on his knees in the field like a sentinel of sorts. Suddenly his roaring laughter resonated through the chaos as he jumped to his feet to continue where he had left off, his rifle reporting its deadly rhythm once more. This was a true testament to the resilience of the human spirit, an ode to bravery echoing amidst the relentless onslaught. Death had brushed him with fleeting fingers, a near miss that had parted his hair, slicing a thin bloody line across his scalp, a curious alteration etched by the passage of a deadly projectile. The boundary between life and oblivion hung by a thread, yet fortune favoured him, sending cheers from his comrades as their spirits were bolstered once more. In the crucible of battle, our brotherhood, bound by blood and tradition, defied the madness that raged around us. Amidst the harrowing battle, a singular figure emerged, an embodiment of courage and nobility amidst the flying mud, lead and fire. Lieutenant Richmond, a young officer of the Gordons, throughout that fateful Sunday, he etched his valour into the very fabric of our fight, a beacon of honour, fighting like a demon claiming the lives of countless enemies. As dusk descended, Lieutenant Richmond, driven by our need for intelligence, ventured once again beyond the safety of the trench. Each step through the treacherous expanse was a calculated gamble in the ceaseless barrage of fire. Slithering like a shadow, he sought insights into the enemy's intentions, a brave endeavour that personified the spirit of the Gordons. Upon each return, new insight into the enemy's force movement were gained, providing invaluable intelligence. On this particular venture, he was mere feet from my position and nearly within grasp of the trench's refuge. The sound of gunfire and exploding shells was indescribable. Flying mud and smoke made it difficult to see more than a few feet beyond the trench. Then my eyes locked with those of the young lieutenant a short distance to my right. He winked at me before he sprang from his concealed stance with a clear intention to make a final dash towards me for safety. He moved like lightning, but fate, unkind and relentless, intervened, guiding a bullet with ruthless precision to its mark. The projectile carved a path through his being, piercing his back and emerging through his heart extinguishing his life in an instant. Time seemed to pause, a scene of sacrifice searing itself into memory as he lay a mere arm's length away from me. Lieutenant Richmond, a comrade in arms, lay fallen, his lifeblood mingling with the soil of that consecrated ground. His noble quest was cut short by war's cruel hand, a life offered in the service of duty. I must confess the warm tears burned down my cheeks as I resumed firing my weapon, exacting the toll for a good man's demise. We fought on, through the tears and the sweat and the blood. Words failed to convey the magnitude of destruction around us. The rapid crack of rifles, the thunderous boom of cannons, and the nightmarish wail of bursting shells combined to form a cacophonous madness that defied comprehension. The air itself was thick with the acrid stench of ruin, and the heavens seemed to rain metal shards and death upon us. The wrath of German artillery materialized in an unforgiving tempest of fury. Trees, the embodiment of nature's tranquility, now stood as shattered husks, their broken forms strewn across the landscape. It was as if the very fabric of existence had been torn asunder, replaced by a whirlwind of metal and fire. From the break of dawn to the encroaching shroud of dusk, the Battle of Mons raged on, a ceaseless onslaught that strained human endurance to its limits. Eight hours of unyielding turmoil, an unremitting maelstrom that tested our resilience and the very core of our beings. As twilight enfolded the land like a somber cloak, the weight of warfare settled upon me like a heavy gloom. The contrast was stark, a once picturesque and serene landscape now ravaged by the grotesque savagery of war. A realm marred by suffering and sacrifice, a portrait of immense horror etched upon the canvas of a nation's innocence. As darkness descended like a veil, the villages ahead erupted in flames. Whether ignited by the hand of the enemy or caught in the crossfire of artillery, these once idyllic hamlets succumbed to the inferno of war. 
Yet, even as the world crumbled around us, the unyielding tide of battle surged forth. In the cloak of night, our senses attuned to the chaos, we discharged our weapons at every movement almost blindly into the dark abyss against the unseen adversary. The resounding boom of artillery punctuated the darkness as our gunners sought to decipher the enigma of German positions in the dark. Amidst all this, an unexpected ally emerged. The German searchlights pierced the inky blackness, casting an eerie glow upon the battlefield. These spectral beams illuminated the trenches, creating a macabre scene of the men within, while also unveiling the fallen, those silent sentinels who had met their fate. It was a spectacle at once dreadful and mesmerizing, a testament to the strange allure that often accompanies the darkest of moments. And yet, even amid this catastrophic whirlwind, a peculiar paradox arose. As the world convulsed with the symphony of destruction, a semblance of serenity embraced some of our comrades. In the very heart of the tempest, certain souls found solace in slumber, their repose as peaceful as if they lay cradled in the gentle arms of their own beds. The clamor of battle and shellfire all receded into the background as these battle-weary warriors surrendered to utter exhaustion, oblivious to the carnage that raged around them. The very heavens themselves seemed to weep, casting an ominous crimson hue upon the landscape as villages burned. The air itself quivered with the infernal breath of war, woven from the interplay of guns, rifles, and the anguished cries of both men and animals. The villagers, forewarned by our somber tidings, had fled from the impending danger. However, they were not spared the brutal spectacle of their own destruction, bearing witness to the devastation that war had thrust upon their once peaceful homes. I tread with utmost care when recounting the villagers' tragic plight, for the weight of their suffering is too profound, too unbearable to be treated lightly. Yet, one poignant incident has seared itself into my memory. An elderly man, his face etched with the lines of time, fleeing desperately to escape the clutches of danger. But fate proved unrelenting as a deadly projectile found its mark, piercing his very being. I watched as he fell, a casualty of war's indiscriminate cruelty, his life force mingling with the very earth on which he lay. In that heart-wrenching moment, the vulnerability of the innocent was laid bare, a poignant reminder of the brutal toll extracted by the marauding forces that had swept through Belgium. Around the stroke of midnight, the command to withdraw echoed through the ranks, a somber call marking the beginning of a grueling retreat. We joined the remnants of the 8th Brigade, embarking on a weary march into the shrouded night. Our bodies ached with exhaustion, yet our spirits remained unyielding. Regrettably, we relinquished the battlefield, the very stage upon which our valour had been etched as the great retreat unfolded, driven by the priorities of necessity to regroup. The Red Cross had tended to the wounded to the best of their abilities, yet heart-wrenchingly some had been left behind comrades fallen in the crucible of conflict. Leaving those men, my brothers, would haunt me forever. The night pressed on relentlessly, a stifling heat enveloping us until finally we were granted a brief respite. Collapsing onto the welcoming bosom of a field, we surrendered ourselves to the embrace of sleep, two hours of precious slumber. The reprieve was short-lived, however, for as the sun rekindled the world, it was not the melodious chorus of birdsong that greeted our ears, but the ravenous bark of shrapnel, a sinister greeting from our relentless pursuers. Rising from our improvised beds, we resumed our march, the lingering bitterness of retreat still palpable. Fatigue bore down upon us heavily, yet the rhythmic pace of our footsteps resonated with determination, a march back to the front lines, a reclamation of the ground we had fought for. By midday, the landscape transformed once again into a battleground as we commenced the laborious construction of trenches, a defiant act etching our presence into the very fabric of the earth. Our comrades of the field artillery resumed their positions behind us, their resounding salvos, a triumphant masterpiece. The ground trembled as their shells soared overhead, a chorus of defiance that offered a modicum of solace to our beleaguered hearts. Amidst this tempest of war, a surreal and breathtaking sight unfolded. Our eyes turned skyward and we beheld an avian apparition, a German aeroplane. The magic quickly evaporated as artillery bore down upon us, turning the surreal world into hell once more, no doubt a result of intelligence provided by that traitorous aircraft. 
It circled like a bird of prey, signaling our position to the enemy below. Yet fate had other intentions. Two of our own aerial champions descended from the skies, archangels with wings of steel and canvas slicing through the air like vengeful spirits. The aerial duel unfurled in breathtaking maneuvers, a deadly dance that defied the very laws of gravity. The sky bore witness to this ethereal combat, both sides showcasing tenacity and skill that commanded awe. And then, with a resounding roar akin to the crash of waves against jagged rocks, our rifles joined the chorus. Our bullets arced upward, a bold salvo aimed at piercing the invaders' wings. The act itself was surreal. A reflection of the ever-evolving nature of warfare, it was a moment of exhilaration amidst the chaos. A glimpse into a future that would forever redefine the boundaries of battle. With my heart afire with determination, I took aim at the elusive target above, the aeroplane weaving like a wisp of smoke in the vast expanse of sky. Whether my shots found their mark or not remained a mystery, but the craft itself was mortally wounded. It masterfully crash-landed just within the reach of my company. The pilot, determined to avoid capture, ignited his petrol tank, a fierce blaze that consumed his machine in a final act of defiance. Darting away like a spectre in the night, he fled, a fleeting shadow intent on escape. Our valiant cavalry would have none of it as they exploded from our ranks in determined pursuit of the grounded vulture. They rode out at great danger to man and steed, and fate played its hand. The pilot was captured, his body miraculously untouched by the fall from the skies. The railway lay adjacent to us, its deep trench beckoning us to seek refuge within its steel embrace. Like ants descending into their burrow, we retreated into the cutting, where the iron tracks served as our guiding path through the labyrinth of our retreat. Alongside this metallic lifeline, we moved, our rearguard action unwavering even as the heavens opened up, drenching us to the bone in torrential rain. In a village we found a brief shelter slumbering in barns, a fleeting moment of rest amidst the unrelenting march. With the rising sun came a new day, once again we emerged to face the relentless enemy, our bodies tired, our spirits bruised but our resolve unbroken. Before us stretched an expanse of coal mines, their discarded heaps of refuse forming an eerie and desolate backdrop. It was here that the German artillery had established their perch. Their batteries concealed behind these grim mounds, they opened up on us with everything they had intent on obliterating our fighting force. A grand duel of artillery ensued, our gunners proving their mettle as they unleashed fiery retribution upon the enemy positions. Their precision proved vital as the German shells fell perilously close to the thin line dividing friend from foe. How does the old adage go? You poke the bull, you get the horns, and so our own guns thundered, silencing the enemy and scattering their ranks as they attempted to advance upon us. A large contingent of German soldiers rushed to intercept us, and our endeavour may have ended in utter defeat were it not for a miraculous stroke of good fortune. We found the loving embrace of friendly trenches by the engineers, providing us with shelter in a concealed trench nestled amidst a cornfield. Beneath the clever camouflage of earth and corn stalks, we readied ourselves for the arrival of our pursuers. From here, we launched our own volley of fire upon the encroaching Germans, the deadly exchange unfolding with brutal success and repelling the relentless enemy. I am unashamed at the pure gratification I felt when I witnessed how bloodthirsty predators were turned to quivering prey by the resolve of brave men who simply said, enough. The following day we stood at Cambrai in what can only be described as hell on earth. The air itself reverberated with the deafening thunder of heavy artillery, an unyielding battle that seemed never ending on all sides. Men continuously fought and died throughout those harrowing days, from the initial clash at Mons to the unrelenting torrents of fire at Cambrai, and we clung to a faint hope, yearning for the French to arrive as our salvation. Our ranks dwindled, our strength waned, and exhaustion gnawed at our very souls. Yet the much-needed aid from our allies remained elusive. The French were locked in their own desperate struggle, unable to extend a helping hand to their beleaguered comrades. This was it, I thought. Here it would all end. Amidst the suffocating stench of mud and blood, I crouched in the muck-soaked trench clinging to my rifle as Armageddon enveloped us. 
The roar of artillery and the crackle of machine guns created a hellish sound that reverberated through the very marrow of my bones. The sky, a relentless grey canopy, seemed to weep tears of fire as shells burst, sending shrapnel scything through the air like deadly rain. Beside me, comrades whispered prayers to a god who had seemingly abandoned this blasted place. The acrid tang of fear mingled with the metallic taste of dread as we fought and fought and fought for our very lives and the lives of those who stood beside us, our hearts pounding in unison. My legs carried me forward, propelled by a combination of instinct and sheer willpower. The mud clung to my boots, threatening to drag me down with every step, but I pressed on, my heart pounding like a war drum in my chest. Bullets whizzed past like angry hornets, their deadly hum a constant reminder of the grim reaper's embrace. The ground seemed to convulse with each explosion, churning the earth into grotesque chaos. Fallen comrades littered the landscape and trenches, their vacant eyes staring into the abyss. A stark testament to the toll of this unrelenting slaughter. My rifle spat fire, its report lost amidst the deafening battle. The enemy, faceless figures shrouded in smoke and haze, met our advances with a wall of lead. Men fell like marionettes with their strings cut, their screams merging with the roar of war. Here, in this macabre dance of death, life was measured in heartbeats and survival a game of chance. Blood mingled with rainwater, creating rivulets of crimson that snaked through the churned up earth. I stumbled over fallen bodies, my boots slipping in the gore-soaked mud. The taste of bile rose in my throat as the horrors of the battlefield unfolded before me. The glistening innards of a fallen comrade, the anguished cries of the wounded, the distant wails like those of a motherless child echoing in the recesses of my mind. But there was no time for contemplation, no space for sentiment. Every ounce of my being was focused on the task at hand, to advance, to survive, to push back the enemy's line. Shells exploded with concussive force, sending shrapnel and dirt in all directions. The air was thick with smoke and the acrid tang of cordite, a sensory overload that bordered on madness. Amid the chaos, faces of fellow soldiers flickered in and out of my vision, their eyes wide with terror and determination. Exhausted and bloodied, I slumped against the muddied wall of a shell crater, my chest heaving with each ragged breath. The cost of these horrid days was measured in lives lost and innocence shattered. At the stroke of half past four, as the weary sun dipped toward the horizon, casting an eerie twilight over the battlefield, I looked out at the desolation before me. The once pristine landscape was now a scarred wasteland. In that moment, amid the ruins of human folly, I felt a profound emptiness, a hollow realization that the price of victory was paid not in glory, but in the shattered hopes and broken bodies of those who had dared to face the tempest head on. Hoofbeats approached our position, a major of artillery galloped forth, his voice carrying the urgency of command as he declared our retreat. B Company, including myself, stepped back across the open expanse, a sunken road beckoning in the distance, a fleeting haven of relative safety. Through turmoil and tumult we traversed the field, shells exploding around and above us like the furious wrath of the heavens. The regiment, once united, now fragmented and shattered in the chaos. The gallant colonel, a figure of indomitable courage, vanished into the void, his fate labelled as missing. Left behind were a mere 175 souls from my own company and the remnants of others, a small band of survivors clinging to a fading ember of hope. Comrades fell beside me, the unyielding hand of war extinguishing lives as if they were mere candles in the storm. Amid this bleak and desolate landscape, valiant Red Cross workers toiled to mend the wounded, yet even their noble efforts could not mend all the broken bodies and shattered souls. A sinister truth emerged. The enemy, with calculated cruelty, turned their weapons even upon hospitals, desecrating the sanctity of care amidst the battlefield. The retreat pressed on, an arduous march marked by exhaustion, a relentless journey spanning seven anguished days across 140 miles. Yet, ironically, our withdrawal transformed into an unintended success, orchestrated by the skillful leadership of Sir John French and his generals. Were it not for their vision, every man in our company would have gladly stood and died there for our comrades and our country. But our retreat 
was the sole viable course of action. A pivotal shift occurred on the Wednesday. We bared our teeth at the relentless enemy, even in retreat. As we traversed the French countryside, we sabotaged bridges and disrupted the enemy's pursuit. A renewed vigor bloomed, a welcome change from the unrelenting onslaught we had endured. When we landed in France, I thought I would live forever. The last few days had convinced me otherwise. I, like many others, had accepted that I would likely die here, if not today, perhaps tomorrow, a dead man walking. Then suddenly, almost bewilderingly, it all changed. To my utter disbelief one morning, Paris appeared on the horizon. My mind could not make sense of survival, but Paris embraced us, a city beckoning as a sanctuary of gratitude. It was almost too much to bear. Adorned with flowers and accolades, we were paraded through the streets, carried in vehicles with a sense of honor reserved for the valiant. Benevolent Americans approached us, offering a glimmer of compassion amidst a sea of foreign tongues. Their inquiries, their genuine concern, provided ointment for our weary souls, reconnecting us to a realm where our language flowed. I don't know how to explain the sensation. I had not expected to live another day. Planning or even just considering the possibility of a future seemed like a fool's thought. I could hardly comprehend what was happening when we were dispatched to Rouen. We were then swiftly driven to the quay and ushered onto a waiting transport bound for the shores of our beloved England. Though my flesh remained largely unmarred by injury, a bullet's kiss grazed my leg in passing, a fleeting touch, a minor injury. Yet fatigue, that unrelenting spectre, enveloped me in its icy grip, while rheumatism gnawed at my bones. Now, hospital walls cradle me, guiding me through the slow process of recuperation. My body heals, my spirit rekindles, and as I gaze out upon the world, my sole desire is to step back into the fray, to rejoin those brave boys fighting and dying as I rest. I do not know how destiny's final note in this symphony of destruction will play for me, for any of us. Private J. Parkinson of the 1st Battalion, Gordon Highlanders. This was World War I, the Battle of Mons, a symphony of destruction, and you are listening to The Law Network. Join us again as we meet other soldiers and listen as they describe in their own words the valour, triumph and heartbreak of war.